Cubs, it's it's been an unusual year uh, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> the coronavirus has changed the way we've lived our lives and in a lot of ways is still shaping the way we go about our day-to-day business, although things have opened up and I think we're all feeling pretty good about that. Uh, here in North Dakota, we're doing very well. Um, we've also had national uh, protests over law enforcement and uh, law enforcement uh, abuses, I, I think it's fair to say. And, you know, there's, there's a lot going on with that as well. Um, and we've had a primary process here in North Dakota that's been unusual because of the coronavirus. It is being held entirely by mail. Um, you know, I have some feelings about that. I And let me, let me ask my guests about that, first of all. State Representative Rick Becker, a Republican from Bismarck. Uh, Rick, I have always... I like the idea of making it easy to vote. Like, I want people who are engaged and want to vote. I I don't want it to be a hassle. But I've always felt that there needs to be some gravity to to the process, right? Like, this is the one of the most important things you do as a citizen, right? I mean, it's like voting, you know, serving on a jury is hugely important. I mean, these are these are important things that we do as citizens. And so I, I just sometimes it's it's with the, with the early voting and, and the vote by mail. I'm not sure it's good for our process. Like voting by mail, I I don't know. Like if you're voting from your couch, or you just does it encourage casual voting? You know, I, I kind of feel like it does. And then also, I I don't know that I like early voting. I think it's a huge advantage advantage for incumbents. I mean, if you're a challenger and you're coming into an election season. And you have to, you're going up against an incumbent, you have to overcome their name recognition, you have to overcome some of the institutional fundraising advantages that they're going to have, uh, and then if, if it's voting early, you're going to have a lot of people casting their ballots and locking their votes in before you even really get a chance to maybe contrast yourself and introduce yourself to them, contrast yourself with the incumbent, maybe reveal some things about the incumbent that might sway some votes. Uh, you know, I don't know. I liked it when we voted on election day, but I, I feel like I'm, people think I'm an old stick in the mud because of that. Yeah. I, I, I see where you're coming from. I think that uh, when it's an occasion, you know, like you said, uh, some gravity to the situation, uh, I think that's a good thing. Um, but of course, allowing at the, the maximal access, I think is also good. So, um yeah. You know, well, I, I think I mean, early and, and voting, I, I in my that. opinion, I mean, is okay, but you can get you can get too too far. You, you know, you get so early, uh, uh, allegedly to to make it easy. Well, okay, the uh, the candidates have barely begun to express what they stand for at at, at that point. So, um, and then this mail in, you know, that's that's a, that's a really interesting thing to me. I um, on on one hand, if I was going to be devil's advocate in favor, you know, I think that people get the ballot. They sit down at the kitchen table and they look at it and they're like, huh, um, I, I didn't think about this race or I never heard about this person. And then they, you know, call their friend or whatever else and say, you know, I, I, what, what do you think about this? Do you know this person? Or they could do some so Google I, that, searching or, or look up good. a website or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I guess that something makes sense. Something like that, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. But, I mean, I, I, want, I want informed voters. I mean, I, I'm always worried about... Yeah people just kind of voting randomly. I helped my daughter vote for the first time. She's 19. Um, Mm -hmm. So this is the first election that she is getting to vote in. Um, And and so we walked through it, and I kind of told her my philosophy. I said, even I, as engaged as I am, I will sometimes run into a local office that I just, I boy, I don't know. Um, You know, like sometimes we're, we're, we're... like electing the weed control board or something, right? It's like, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> you know? And so I just, I don't vote. Yeah. Like, if I don't know the candidates, I don't vote in that race. And I, I next time it's like, okay, I need to do better, obviously, and engage on this race. But I I, I think I think sometimes we need, to, I, I worry about people just voting randomly. Or it's like, oh, I heard that guy's name on the TV more. I'll, I'll vote for him. Like, oh, that's how we're going to choose yeah. who's governing us, you know? But I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how we... And I think that's... I think that happens a lot, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't like early voting as much, and I don't know how you would separate the two. Voting by mail is, is, is more okay with me than the early voting. I've really come to believe that that is such a huge, um, it's such a huge advantage for incumbents. And listen, campaigns are supposed to be like a crucible, right? It's supposed to put you elected officials through your paces. And hopefully at some point, 
um, something will happen and we'll sort of break through the veneer, break through some of the polish. And this is this is less true of local races where the politicians tend to be a little more down to earth and a little less polished and perfect than maybe some of the statewide and higher up races. But to me, I mean, we're, we're supposed to break through the talking points and, and hopefully reveal something true during the course of a campaign. But if you've already locked in your vote and something gets revealed to you, you can't change that vote. Yeah, you know, true. very true. So anyway, that's 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 an you know the uh, the other thing about this mail in is that is that I think is worthy of note is is how we essentially have a mandated uh, mail in only, and I know it's not exactly mandated, but it kind of is mandated, and and I think that it was it was smart uh, for Bergam and his executive orders to prepare for the possibility that it would be required. Um, by by lifting the requirement for having at least one polling place as far as a requirement, but but I think that it it should have been like okay this is going to be a possibility that we're prepared for, um, but until we say otherwise, please let's let's all uh, you know all the counties let's plan to move forward with voting as usual, and if this whole COVID situation seems to really be following a trajectory which prohibits. Uh, voting in person, then we're ready to go and we'll pull the trigger on that. But we, we never got, actually got close to that. So I think we, I think we jumped the gun, um, in, in, in sort of, yeah. I guess, uh, strongly, you know, the quote, strongly encouraging, uh, the voting by mail only. And I think that's a disservice to the people, frankly. Well, yeah. I, t- to me, it's hard. I mean, you roll back the clock. I mean, it's 2020 hindsight. I, it, you're right. He was absolutely right to prepare. I don't know. I have a hard time second guessing at least some decisions made with coronavirus because when at the time some of these decisions were being made, there was just so much we didn't know. And there was so much turmoil and it, it was it was hard. I, I'm glad I didn't have to make those decisions. Let's put it that way. Um, let's talk about the primary, though, a little bit because it's been an unusual. In fact, I was just reading... Uh, uh, a, an article by my colleague Patrick Springer um, that he was he was kind enough to to, to interview me for and, and and quotes me in um, among other sort of political observers in the state and it's it's interesting because because what a lot of people are saying and I know you have some feelings about this leading sort of a uh, a caucus within the Republican Party the the, the Bastiat caucus and I, I realize you, you're a founder um, I think State Representative Dan Ruby is currently the leader but but certainly you're a leader within that movement. Um, you know, Governor Burgum has, has been involved in this primary in a, in a big, big way. And I've heard some people, you know, sort of talk about how it's a routine or a return to, to machine politics. Um, it's boss Burgum. I hear people throwing around. What are your thoughts on, on, on Governor Burgum's pride? And, and I should describe for people, I guess, who haven't been paying attention, his involvement in this process is by the way if you're listening to this podcast i'm assuming you've probably been paying attention to this stuff i don't know how you found me if you haven't been paying attention to this stuff but um basically governor Burgum has a um you know he's had a a rocky relationship with the legislature uh this election cycle he has uh he, some of his his staff or former staff i should say some of his people have founded a PAC, a political action committee and the way they structured it, they are spending big money supporting the, the, the legislative candidates that they, they want. And obviously, they've been involved in the state treasurer's race as well. Um, and he, he has poured a lot of his own money into it. He uh, has he's raised some money from, from sort of his network of, of friends, a lot of out-of-state people. But for the bulk of it, his own money spending in these races. And that's pretty unusual because typically we don't have... Typically, you don't see politicians spend their own money like that. So, Governor, you see, that's what he's doing. And, you know, there's been accusations that he's trying to buy the legislature or its executive branch, you know, meddling in the legislature. What are your thoughts on this, Rick? Well, I think that uh, to say he's putting uh, a lot of his own money in isn't <laughs> giving him the, uh, the clearest uh, picture. I mean, it's okay. the, the amount is staggering. Uh, nearly $2 million of his yeah. own money going directly to uh, candidates or yeah. mostly to the PAC that his people formed at sure. his you know, direction. And the amount is important because, as you know, in a lot of the legislative races, uh, statewide, state legislative races, district 
races, um, you can run an entire campaign on ten to twenty thousand dollars. Right. And there's definitely outliers, and those are the ones that you know frequently get written about. You know, the, one of the Senate races in Bismarck, for example, was in, well, in well, 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 well into the six figure territory. And it, it kind of depends. Like if, right. it's, if it's a hot race. Right. Or it's it's an area where one party or the other is trying to peel off, you know, break some new ground into an, into a district, you know, controlled by another. Or it's a race that just gets a lot of attention. But typically across the state, like you said, ten to twenty thousand dollars is a pretty typical right. legislative mean, campaign. In, in twenty twelve, a brand new district that I was that that I found myself in when I ran for the first time, it was about ten grand. Um, so now when you think about uh, Bergen putting in about $2 million, you're talking about a lot of power to get people that he wants into these various legislative seats. Yeah. Um, some of it is obvious retribution for, uh, for, for instance, Jeff Delzer uh, with appropriations. He seems to be definitely targeting uh, the, the more conservative uh, people in, uh, on that spectrum in the, the Republican Party. And it's, it's also concerning. He, he's completely throwing terms on their heads as far as, uh, you know, saying that this person is a, 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 a tax cutter or a spending watchdog or a conservative. And and there's no regard whatsoever to whether there's a basis for that, whether it's factual. I mean, it's kind of, you know, there's this there's this idea and we saw it when he was running for governor the first time that, you know, you say what you need to say and you just keep and you just inundate the people with that message yeah. and w- without any regard for whether there's a kernel of truth in it, um, you, you just keep repeating it. And that's why uh, I think people in North Dakota probably in many districts, at least were getting sick of all of the mailers. I mean, sometimes three a day and they're negative uh, mailers yeah. for the opponent. So I, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I was, I'm really dismayed to see Burgum's entry like this. Um, I've disagreed with him on a lot of things in the past, but we, uh, but I have always been respectful. I've defended him when there were sort of conflicts with the legislature because I thought the legislature was being a little, a little bit petty because he, you know, was the outsider. But I can't. And, 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 he, and he did. He did He's run. Just, I, he ran against them too. I mean, he ran against the quote unquote good old boys club in Bismarck. That has left you know some some lasting resentment. Yeah, from yeah. people who've been in Bismarck I mean, a right. long time. His campaign was whatever his campaign people, you know, told him to run on. Well, and in a Trump I, in a Trump year, that was that was the thing that to worked. say. Yeah, uh, and, and and absolutely it worked. And and sure, and and for any moderately thin skinned politicians, that was gonna that gonna be bothersome. And so the yeah. conf- and and frankly, I like conflict between the executive and legislative. It's, sure, it was very pleasant to see that. Be- there should with, be uh, Bergam where we didn't have it with Dalrymple or Hoven. Yeah. Well, it was there. I, I, I think sometimes with, with Hoven especially, um, that he was very much a behind-the-scenes guy. Um, so it was there, just it wasn't right out in front. And, and I, I think it's fair to say wasn't as uh, um, vigorous <laughs> as a friction as maybe yeah. we've seen. I mean, I, mean, I mean, at one point, Governor Burgum you know, got, got kicked off the Senate floor because he was wearing jeans. You know, I mean, right. he's the governor. <laughs> Um, I mean, some of that stuff's petty. And, and frankly, I, I thought what Jeff Delzer did with Governor Burgum's budget, the way he did it, was petty. I mean, you you do that right as the governor's getting ready to get up and give his budget address. You pull that move. Um, I th- I thought that was unnecessary. You know, I I think if you want to do that, I, I think it's it's not. Nece- I think it's a defensible policy position to question how involved the executive branch should be in the legislature's budgeting process we've had that debate for a long time um but the way he did it i thought was needlessly provocative um well i'm i'm not sure about that i mean you you may be right um i don't know of the true details um on on how it was handled because the that that move if we want to call it a move was was really just a step um in in a process that had been going on for a couple of of sessions where we're pulling away from um, having the governor set the budget and then us working off of the governor's budget, um, you know, back to what was, I guess, more closely uh, sure. as originally intended. 
so I, it wasn't like out of the blue, like, okay, screw Burgum, you know, cause we, he's not one of us. And so we're going to throw this on him that it was in the works to do that, regardless of even if Wayne Fincham had won, that would have been put in place. Mm-hmm. Now, how it was done, I don't actually know the details. So maybe you could be right. Let me, let me play. Uh, now, listen, uh, you remember the 2016 campaign. I was tough on Duff, Doug Burgum. And a big yep. part of it was because a lot of the things we said, no, I think his campaign was just spouting poll tested one liners, whatever was going to grab, you know, grab a hook in some voters mind and get them to vote. Um, I thought it was cynical. I thought it was as authentic as a $3 bill. And I didn't like it. I was much more interested in, in the actual Doug Burgum. You know, and I think I wrote this at the time. I, I'm, I'm a lot more interested in who Doug Burgum actually is as opposed to this avatar he creates for himself for campaign season. Because overall, I think mm-hmm. Doug Burgum's a good leader. Um, I think the way he campaigns really? is, is deeply, deeply cynical. Uh, so I didn't like that. I didn't like it in 2016. I, I have been critical of his approach this primary season in 2020 where he's talking about um, – he is talking about just just the way he's doing it, you know, throwing in his own money like this. Um, but let me play devil's advocate for a moment. If you just look at the legislative races, and obviously this doesn't apply to the treasurer's race because we didn't have a state convention, so there is no party-endorsed candidate. But in the legislative races, out of the districts that he's chosen to get involved in, just one candidate that he's opposing has the local party's uh, endorsement. That's Jeff Magram in District 28. I always, I always get the mm-hmm. district number screwed up. District 28. I think that's right. Um, Jeff Magrum's the only one with, with, with his local party's endorsement that Governor Burgum's opposing. Everybody else has been endorsed by their local party. Isn't this Governor Burgum just backing the endorsed candidates? No. No, I mean, he, and I don't even think you believe that. Um, yeah, but it's sure, true. One. But and, it's, and but it could, it's, but it's true. I mean, zero. It could have been four. The, the thing is, he's backing them based on their how, how they behave as legislators are they conservatives that are going to stick to conservative principles he has no room for that at all are they people that are going to be more quote pragmatic that he can quote work with um that are going to be more likely to do things like vote for the theodore roosevelt library um after you know after <laughs> being pushed on it for four months yes and so um, in this particular cycle, it was one out of, what are we looking at, five um, um, state uh, dist- uh, di- legislators? Um, it, it could have, and, and so because there was one, and there could have been zero, I mean, that might fit into what you're saying, but it could have also been that there were three or four out of the five that were endorsed. I, I don't, I really don't, I, I think that it's much clearer that the way things are lining up is based on ideology, not based on um, whether they're endorsed or not. I and and also to say that he's focused on the endorsed candidates completely flies in the face of how he's conducted his own race. He was not the endorsed candidate. He doesn't yeah. care about the endorsement process. There's that's no fair. evidence for that whatsoever. Yeah, that's fair. He came in third place. When he ran in 2016 yeah. at the statewide convention, he came in third place behind yourself and uh, and Wayne Stengem. Uh and then he went on to the primary, and obviously he won at the at, at the primary. So uh, in June that year, so uh, I I think you're right. I mean, I don't I don't think, but but it I mean it's it's the idea that that he's these candidates that he's backing have local support. I mean that's that's what I'm trying to say. I mean it's not like they're a bunch of carpetbaggers that Governor Burgum's just propping up, e- except for one instance, they won their lo- they won at their local conventions, right? I mean that, that's mm-hmm. got that's got to speak sure. for something. I guess. I mean, <laughs> we we know he doesn't care about the the the, yeah. the party process or the endorsing conventions. So I I mean, like I say, it 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 the only reason it has way is because of how it randomly plays out that one out of five was endorsed. I mean, but if you fo- if you look at the ideology, then suddenly it lines up to be one hundred percent. Now, er- earlier I I said that I I felt that all, in the aggregate, Governor Burgum's been a good leader, and I I do believe that. I have areas where I disagree with him, but for the most part, I think he's been a good governor. And and you kind of said, really? Do you disagree? You, you don't think Governor Burgum's been a good governor? Well, I think he's. I, I, I don't think he's been 
horrible. I don't know. I'm, I was curious what makes him a good governor so far that he's done. Now, he's looking for efficiencies, right? So, And I like that. I love that. Um, looking for efficiencies of government. And I like the idea that he broke the the um the sort of coronation the heir apparent where you take your turn and you do your time and you you play by the rules and so you know broke that up but i mean i, I get i'm 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 certainly open i don't think he's been a good lead, leader for covid during this covid process i mean i i i think you can look just one state south to find uh much better leadership there but um, I, I'm open. I mean, you tell me what makes him a, a, a good a good leader, a good governor. I, I think he has handled the COVID situation. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, Governor Nome in South Dakota has probably had a lighter touch than, than Governor Pergam did. But, man, you look at some other places like Michigan or, or even we, we were talking about the show. You just got back from Colorado, places like that. We've been – North Dakota has been a significantly more pleasant place to ride out coronavirus than there and i, I realize maybe oh, that's, yeah. maybe that's maybe that's damning with faint praise but you know <laughs> exactly for for, 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 for for the most part i feel like he's done an okay job i mean i'm not i'm not wanting to give the guy the nobel peace prize but i i think he's done fine and i i think some of his efficiencies well, like, have been great I, 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 I really do like the way he's he's mixed things up in in the executive branch he's challenged some of these ideas that you know for instance different departments of the executive branch can't share resources um he's pushed through a lot of that stuff i think it's a big deal i, I think it matters and some of the stuff that people really hang their hand on like the teddy roosevelt library i'm, I'm honestly struggling to understand why that's so controversial um well, the the uh, the thing about the library, in my mind, it, it, you, you, there's the actual money on it, right? But it's that small beans compared to the overall budget. Uh, it is kind of a, a a little a little irritating because of because of the, the the amount of money for what it actually gets. The biggest thing in my mind, though, is and this is this is uh, a criticism of the legislature more than it is of Bergam. Um, but Bergam had his pet project that he wanted. Yeah. And there were, in the beginning there was he wasn't ever even close to uh going to succeed in getting that passed. But he just kept hammering and hammering and he kept working behind the scenes to get and so in that respect he you know, I don't know if you'd say leader, um, but he He's politically persistent. he got exactly what he wanted. Yeah. Uh, and and that's exactly what he's doing now. He's saying what he needs to say, and he's doing what he needs to do, and spends what he wants to spend to get what he wants. And um, so my problem is that he's got these pet projects, kind of like uh, the COVID testing. You know, it's kind of a pet thing for him. He wants to be number one in the nation. He's following the metrics that really aren't doing anything to slow the spread or save lives, but they sure are a good metric that he can say we're number two in the nation and, and keep working to be number one in the nation, um, regardless of the cost and regardless of the data or science. I agree with you that a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that he's done has been cynical, although it's, I, I don't know. I mean, you start throwing the word cynical around in politics. Who doesn't that apply to, but uh, you know, he's, he's done it. I mean, I, I look at the treasures race, for instance, um, on one hand, I have Tom Beadle running radio ads saying, uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a, could, you know, I'll support Donald Trump's agenda. And then I have Dan Johnson out here talking about how pro-life he is as if neither of uh, both of them have forgotten what the treasurer actually does, which is not much, frankly. Um, it seems like, like the, the better debate would be whether or not we even need this office anymore, but we have these two people running on platforms that, that, that really have little to do with. With what the treasurer's office does, which I guess is maybe what happens when the treasurer's office just doesn't do very much, but it's 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 very cynical and it's it's very frustrating to me, and I don't like that. But isn't mm-hmm. this isn't this the game, Rick? Because I'm I'm thinking like the the, the Bastiats, and I I'm, I'm I'm trying to be very careful because I realize sometimes Bastiat gets thrown around like like Tea Party was thrown around, and, and sometimes it can be a little nebulous, particularly if you get people who are not in elected office who's in and who's out and i i don't know sometimes that's hard to define but I, i'm thinking i i know that that bastiat aligned legislators have sort of run insurgencies in in some legislative districts i'm thinking up here in minot one of our legislative districts um uh, ole larson bastiat leader 
uh, you know, sort of brought his people to a, to his local convention and got his candidates there, and and he won. And honestly, more power to Oli. I mean, we're we're governed by who shows up. He got his people to the convention. He won. And there was a lot of grumbling in my mind about those candidates. A lot of people didn't really like those candidates, but you know what? They were the endorsed Republican candidates. And that was it. So, I mean, isn't that the game? I mean, is it obviously Governor Bergup's doing it on a different level, and he has his personal wealth that he could pour into this, which is a sort of a very unique thing. But I mean, he's playing the game. He's not being he's not being coy about it. He's not trying to hide anything. It's right out in front. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, on uh, to a degree, um, yes, I agree with you. There there are some distinct. Uh, differences uh, what, what you discussed with uh you know insurgency or the bastiat um, you're talking about district level politics sure. and grassroots movements and people saying you know we that and, and it's really what the bastiat group was all about if you look at the platform of the republican party and then you look at how the republican party in the state has conducted itself you can say you know maybe it would be great if we could try and adhere more closely to the actual platform. And one way to do that would be to associate with other people who feel the same way. And we can toss a name on that association called, I mean, that's really all it is. So then you, and then you have in district politics. Yeah. You know what? I agree. Let's get somebody in there because the the person who has been in there is, is just sitting, filling a seat. They're not abiding by the platform, which is why we're in the Republican party. So let's get someone else in and let's work hard. That's that's district politics. That's that's sure. the beauty of local politics and, and our representative form of government. Now you move it up to the governor's office, and yeah, there's there's some of that um, that can be expected. Usually, it's you know got a, a little more maybe um, I don't know. <laughs> there's there's a certain there's a certain degree of comport with the office that you sort of just expect, or as opposed to getting muddy. And and basically going through these machinations of using the bullet points and the terms in ways that are completely misleading for the sole purpose of stacking your legislature to get what you want. I, I, I think I just think it's very unseemly. It's I'm I'm not saying it's it's certainly it's not illegal. I'm not saying it's improper that he should be removed from office. But I think it's unseemly, and um, I think it shows some disregard for uh, the division between the, the executive and the legislative branch. I mean, you know, <laughs> it'd be one thing to say, um, I, I'm Doug Burgum, I'm your governor, and I support these guys. That would be even a, a big step for what, how, what we've normally seen. But then you actually form the, a pack, throw in a ton of money, more than North Dakota politics has seen, and for for these types of races, where you effectively are saying, I'm going to buy this race. I mean, he wouldn't be putting in that much money if he didn't think he could buy the race. I guess we're going to find out if he's successful. Well, nobody, that, nobody would donate any money to any campaign if they didn't think that campaign could win. Um, you know, I mean, that that's just and, and listen, I, I you use the word unseemly. I've used that exact same word to describe the way Governor Burkham's handled this. I think he's going to get a lot of blowback from, and I guess we'll find out. But I, I, I suspect there are at least some voters, whether or not it's enough to to upset the apple cart for what Governor Burgum's going for here. But I, I think mm-hmm. there's probably at least some voters who are turned off by the way he's done this. The idea that he's just going to spread around his own money that when it's when it's one per, it, as opposed to like if he had like a grassroots network of supporters, you know, so, sort of the Burgum coalition, and he had people from across the state donating to this money to this pack to turn around and then support so, sort of the candidates that Burgum wants. That's much more grassroots than I'm Doug Burgum and I'm going to write a check, and also a few of my friends are going to write checks too. That's kind of what he's done, and that is absolutely unseemly. And I think there's probably going to be some backlash from voters against that. Whether or not that's enough to to upset what he's going for, I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna find out here shortly. But beyond that, I I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's the game. I, I don't I don't have a problem with the governor supporting his own slate of candidates. You know, these are the people I think that are going to for, for the same reason that you're saying, well, the party platform and and I think that these candidates best promote what I believe in and what the Republic, what I think the, the Republican Party believes in and, and the platform. Governor Burgum's just kind of doing the same thing. Right. Well, I, yeah, again, there's there's a difference based on the offices he's holding and and 
the, I guess, almost the, the course of nature of the amount of money he's putting in. Um, and, and you're right. He, beyond that, which, but that still holds some weight. But beyond that, perhaps you're right. I mean, I can complain that he's truly a Republican in name only and that uh, him remaking the legislature in his image is not good for the Republican Party. Um, and frankly, it's not good for the state because when we have a, a more diluted Republican Party, uh, it, it just furthers that whole, it, it increases the inroad for a one party system in North Dakota. If you were to have a more uh, ideologically aligned party to its own platform in the Republican Party, you would give way to uh, a more, uh, more of a role for the second party in North Dakota, and that would be a healthier um, society politically. So I, I, I think what Ber- Bergam is doing as a, as, a, as a rhino, you know, I'll say it, um, is, is, not, is not good for, for North Dakota. Well, Rick, I appreciate it. Any any final thoughts? We're uh, we're recording this obviously before we have the results of the the vote. But uh, yep. any final thoughts? Any predictions for the for the vote outcome? I I don't no I I don't have predictions. But I'll I'll say this. You know, a lot of people say, well, the the politically, uh, I've never been one to pretend um, something that I don't actually believe. I think that this is a huge huge primary. Uh, for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. And if Bergham's people win, I, I, it will be a huge blow to conservatism, to the conservative wing of the party, uh, to the Bastiats. Um, it, it, it's, this is huge, and it will be a stunning loss. Uh, and of course, uh, political wisdom would say, well, he probably is going to win those seats because political wisdom would say when you outspend your candidates uh, and bombard the people with with, uh, with 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 information, however, whether it's true or not, um, you're more likely to win. So we'll we'll see what happens. Now, if he lo- if his people don't win, it will be a stunning loss for Bergam, um, yeah. and it will show that despite being an incumbent with name recognition and a boatload of money, he couldn't get his people in, even yeah. though, as you said, five out of six or four out of five were even endorsed. Um, so this is going to be huge, and we're either at the end of tonight or whatever, when we find the results, we're either going to see a huge movement toward the conservative wing of the party or of the meaningless uh, moderate wing of the party. It's going to be interesting because I'm not sure I'm going to be ready to jump to either conclusion because I think one thing we've got to keep in mind, we always see this when we, we have like uh, – like special elections in Congress and the national media kind of tries to read the tea leaves, you know, some, some, uh, some legislative district in Michigan, you know, has a special election and the legislatures or this would be the national media is trying to extrapolate from that, you know, sort of, sort of larger trends. And I, I think we need to be careful because sometimes these races are very intensely local and they may hinge on just, you know, how, how that person is viewed in his community. I mean, a lot of these, leg- I mean, you know, as well as anybody, these legislative races sometimes are settled by just dozens of votes um, in, in a primary, even more so than the general election. So, you know, sometimes it's it's personal and sometimes it's local and it might not have anything to do with Doug Burgum or, his, or anybody else. It might just be that person in that district. I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting mm-hmm. to kind of look back and do some forensics on this, these races after the fact to see. And let, me, and let me ask you one last question, because this is something that when I Patrick Springer was interviewing me, I thought was an interesting point. Generally, the Republican position is money is speech, right? So we don't want to we don't want to limit money. Yep. North Dakota has very few limits on on campaign spending. Um, do you feel? I mean, because you're talking a lot about Governor Burgum, you know, influencing this with his money. Do you think like we need to put limits on? Campaign spending no. or campaign donations? No, no. Okay. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I think, I, I think it would be unseemly for the governor to show up drunk to to his office, right? But I don't think we should make a law that says the governor can't drink while he's holding sure. office. Right. So, I, yeah, it's. It, I think what he's doing is crap, but I don't think we need to have a knee-jerk uh, legislative intervention. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, Rick, I appreciate your time and your your comments, and it's always a pleasure to talk with you. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thank you.